Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, episode 50. Ryan Ray here. How is it going? And I am really excited today because we have on Mark LaCour. If you don't know Mark LaCour, then you should. He is the podcasting uh, godfather, as I like to call him, for oil and gas and energy podcasts. He's kind of paved the way for a lot of folks like myself and have a lot of respect for Mark, not only for what he does on the air, for what he does off the air. He's a really great guy, uh, does all kinds of work in the community. Be sure to check out his full bio in the show notes where you can get all kinds of good information from Mark. He sends out a monthly newsletter, and uh, it's just great. Mark's a great guy. We talk about all kinds of stuff today, the Paris Climate Agreement. We talk about OPEC. We talk about President Trump. I uh, hope you enjoy the discussion. Here is Mark LaCour. Well, Mark, if there's one thing that validates this podcast, it's having you on every 50 episodes. Uh, so this is episode 50. You're on for episode one, and so it's good to have you back. Yeah, it's great to be back, Ryan. It's uh, We've both been busy, but I would just first thing before we get into anything else, I want to congratulate you on your success to your podcast. You're growing, you're rocking and rolling. I listen to you, so good good stuff. Well, I'll, I'll ask for your evaluation off the air so the listeners <laughs> don't get it. But, well, you know, Mark, obviously you know this, and the, the listeners may or may not know, but you're an inspiration to me and to probably any other energy podcast out there. You're kind of the godfather of oil and gas and energy podcasts. So thank you for what you've done to kind of open up this world to us that, you know, for a long time, oil and gas and energy was kind of off the radar as far as media goes, and you kind of forged that market for us. Yeah, it really is. It's a uh, new media has taken over and it's we're just uh, as an industry, we're a bit behind times, but I'm see, starting to see it take off like crazy. And it's cool because what's happening is we're we're getting around the conventional media and telling true, useful, valuable stories. Um, I mean, I've seen a bunch of, of short YouTube videos of people that work in this industry and it's just great stuff, stuff you'd never see on CNN or, you know, I- anywhere else. And so, you know, you're part of that movement as well, that new media movement. And just, you know, it's it's almost like a it's almost like we're a family, right? We're, we're all yeah. in this together. Well, here's the thing that I've noticed is that I've had on uh, guests, and I don't ask for political affiliation, but I'm sure some on the left, I'm sure some on the right. And you know what? We haven't had anybody hang up or get mad or throw a fit, and we've had discussions. And just, just kind of hear, what are you thinking? And that's one thing in the mainstream media you almost can't do. You just can't let someone express what they think, whether you agree or disagree with it. And we, we try to be that platform. I don't try to really voice my opinion a lot. I want to let the listeners be the kind of the judge of what the guest says. But um, that's really what we try to foster. And you found that there's a lot of common ground amongst energy professionals. Yeah, and, and I agree with you 100%. The conventional media tries to show both opposite sides at their extreme and tries to cause conflict. And humans are not like that. I have a bunch of good friends that I disagree with politically and they disagree with me, but we're good friends. And we can have intelligent, thoughtful conversations around the important things that are going on both in our industry and in, in our world. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, once again, it's the new media tells the real story much better than the conventional media does. OK, so let's get into it. Um, this will come out, I think, next week. So uh, we're recording on June 5th for the listeners sake. But the Paris Agreement you know, just went down. That was the big news last week. Kind of give me your thoughts and your reactions to you know what President Trump said and, and the reaction and, and where, where should, how should we think about this? Yeah, so I think pulling out the Paris Climate Agreement, I don't think I know, pulling out the Paris Climate Agreement was the right thing to do for a whole bunch of reasons. And I could actually sit here for two hours and talk to you about climate science. Uh, unfortunately, very few people have an opinion on the climate, understand the science. You know, if I ask most people if they know the difference between weather and climate, or do they understand the laws of thermodynamics, or can they name any of the, can they name one of the nine cloud types, or, you know, is the greenhouse effect man-made or is natural? They get it all wrong, and yet they still have an opinion. So the, the truth is, the climate is cyclic to begin with. So we have an ice age every 100, 120,000 uh, 20, years. And the ice age is a period of global cooling. So Ryan, if you look out your window right now and you don't see glaciers, that means by default, we are in a period of global warming. Global warming is normal. It happens in between the ice ages as that pendulum swings. What's up for discussion is man's activity speeding up the swinging of that pendulum. Is man's activity speeding up the global warming cycle? And honestly, there's not enough data out yet to call that. We need about another 50 years of data collection before we can see if we're actually influencing that. Um, but if, let's say that we are influencing the climate in a negative way, and we're looking to um, reduce the greenhouse effect, that's what all of this is about. And the greenhouse effect, Ryan, is really simple. Our planet is warmer than it should be, right? If you look at the amount of heat or amount of energy we receive from the sun, and you look how much that we dissipate in space, our planet really should be much colder than it is right now. And the greenhouse effect is a natural effect. And it's where our atmosphere almost lacks like a blanket, and it bounces some of that heat, which would normally radiate back into space, back to the Earth. And so our planet's warmer than normal. 
Well, if you Google, and I challenge anybody that's listening to do this, Google top greenhouse gases. And the number one greenhouse gas, which causes 85% of the greenhouse effect, is water vapor. Carbon dioxide is about 4% at its best of the greenhouse effect. So if you really believe that man's activity has impacted the speed of global warming, you would want to look at the bigger cause, which is the water vapor, which nobody looks at. And the reason nobody looks at, there's no money to be made in pulling water vapor right. out the air. Um, and there's money to be made on the taxation and the remediation of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is normal. It's uh, about 400 parts per million in the air right now. In the past, the Jurassic, the Triceric, the Pleistocene before mankind existed, it was much higher. It has gotten as high as 5,000 parts per million in our past. So, um, the, the, but the Paris Climate Deal was all built around reducing CO2 emissions, but it was done in a way that was very biased. So our air pollution and our water pollution peaked in 1978 in this country. And even our CO2 emissions go down every year, whether you believe that makes a difference in the greenhouse effect or not. Same way in Europe. What's happened is these emerging economies, India, China, and so on, they're dumping a lot of carbon dioxide in the air. We are over the hump. We're over the bell curve. However, the way the Paris Climate Deal was put together, we would pay a lot of money. Well, that's not really fair. We've gotten the problem licked. It's getting better and better every year. Um, same way in Europe. It's the emerging economies that actually should pay a large affair. And so what I think Trump did, you'll hear it here first. And like I said, I don't have a crystal ball. I think from a business point of view, he's pulling out of the deal so that he can renegotiate it. What should have happened is President Obama's administration should have brought this deal, since it was a deal with foreign governments, to Congress so that Congress could do its due diligence and then vote on it to represent the rights of Americans. And he didn't. And the reason he didn't is he knew that it would get shot down. So he used an executive action to enter into the deal, which means we can't negotiate. It's like when you sign a business contract. Once the contract's signed, you can't negotiate that contract anymore. I think what uh, President Trump's doing is pulling us out of the deal so that we can look at it again in a fresh light and renegotiate it. So we'll see if I'm right about that. Yeah, and you, you brought a couple things there. And the first thing is, I think that if you're on the right or the left, we, we have to step back and look at executive power and say, you know, what should the executive be able to do? which he not be able to do because we've kind of lost that almost. We kind of get our guy in and he does something and the next guy comes in, he can just snatch it away. And then you go, whoa, whoa, hold on. And so kind of, you know, it's just four to eight years, these executive uh, orders can be, you know, changed. And so Congress is, has to play a role. Obviously we know why no one wants to do it with Congress because they're so inadequate most of the time. But the other right. thing that you talked about, and I want you to kind of expound upon this for the listeners here, because you talked about not having enough data. I know you're big into big data. That's one of the things that you talk about a lot and that you've been involved with, and you, you always are in, in this big data kind of cutting edge stuff. When we think about climate change, you know, if you go back and look at the models that they've used, they've been wrong, and not by a little bit, but by a lot. And so for someone like myself, you go, well, okay, let's just say that the, the climate change people are correct. I, I have a hard time believing you because your models are so wrong. But I think big data may actually begin to start to change that where we can actually now possibly predict the climate? Or do you disagree with that? No, I, I think we can in the future. Now, the thing you have to remember is literally everything affects the climate. Literally, the butterfly flapping of its wings affects the climate. Something you never hear of is one of the things about weather, and, the, and climate is what's the macro, right? Is the globe, it's 30 to 50 year cycles. Weather's what's happened to you locally. It's, it's right now in Houston, it's the rain that we had for the last two days. That's the weather. That's the difference between weather and climate. The thing that um, a lot of people don't understand is that the the models that are used, the model is based upon a hypothesis, so it's, which is basically an educated guess. And then you build the data around that model to support your theory. So the climate models, you're right, they've gotten it wrong. If you're old enough, if you're as old as I am, you remember in the 80s, there was a the cover of Time magazine had had that we're entering into the next ice age. And the climate scientists at that time had plans to sprinkle cold dust on the Arctic and Antarctic so that it would warm up so we wouldn't enter the next ice age. Um, they were obviously wrong. The problem with the climate models is that it's done backwards. So I'll give you a perfect example. And this is, this is facts. This is real data. 91%, 91.5% of all child molesters arrested in the U.S. have change in their pocket. Therefore, you could make the logical conclusion that if you have change in your pocket, you have a very high chance of being a child molester. Right. Well, that's, right. Not, that's right. not true. Right. That's how the climate models are built. They say that they think the climate's warming faster than it should because of man's activity. Then they go find the data to support that. And that is not a scientific method of doing anything. All you're doing is supporting your own hypothesis. And the other thing, Ryan, is you don't hear about all the same type of scientists that have built climate models that show the opposite, that we're nearing the peak of global warming. And, and, and soon, as in soon, like another 20,000 years, we're going to enter to another ice age. Now, you and I sit here in, uh, well, I sit here in Houston, Texas. You're a little bit, a little bit further away from me. But the thing is, here in Houston, if the, the climate change proponents are right, the most that we're going to see is about a two-degree increase Celsius 
in our in our temperatures, which is about four degrees. So instead of our, our normals running at 92 to 95, you know, it's going to run 96 to 99. Now, that is an impact to the way we live. It, it will be. But the flip side, Ryan, is if we have an ice age, Houston will be under about 5,000 feet or about a mile of ice. That's a much bigger impact <laughs> to the way we lead our lives than a, a warming of a, a few degrees. So um, the, the modeling is just not there yet. And, and the way they go about it is not accurate. And you're right. So big data will be able to fix this, our ability to crunch troves and troves of, of, of information. But from a climate point of view, a lot of the data we have goes back from to actually forensic type fossil type stuff, literally coring the Arctic and figuring out what year that snow was laying down and then doing um, gas analysis on that snow to figure out what components were in the atmosphere at that time. That only gets you so far. That, that gives you, you know, a snapshot into every 50,000 years, 50, 80,000 dollars years where we're saying that we've sped up global warming in the last couple of decades, and it's just too short a period of time. So we need to collect data, real data, uh, for about another 50 years, and then crunch that data using big data analytics. And then we can say one way or the other whether man's activity has accelerated global warming. We're just not there yet. Yeah, and, and one final thing, and I want to move on to, uh, to oil and gas stuff, but I, I was kind of stock, shocked this weekend. I thought, you know what, if I was a nuclear, I would come out and say, hey, you know what, if you want to reduce emissions, roll back some of our regulations and let us go to work because it would seem that that would be the natural partner to the zero emissions crowd is nuclear. But even those guys are hampered by regulations and they can't get done what they want to get done. Yeah. So Greenpeace started as an anti-nuclear movement, right? They're also anti-hydro, so dams. Um, nuclear is the safest way to produce electricity in the world. Just bottom line, just looking at the numbers. Um, it's just people don't like the idea of it. And so it doesn't go anywhere. And there's a lot of regulation that gets in the way and adds costs, which means they can't compete. If you remove a lot of that regulation, they can make electricity for fractions of a penny for forever. Um, the other thing, though, is, is you, you know, if your listeners out there, you may wonder, why are all the big oil and gas companies supporting a stand in the Paris Climate Agreement? You know, is it marketing BS? No, no, no. They really are supporting Exxon and Shell and Chevron and Statoil and everybody. You want to know why, Ryan? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know why. That's why I got you on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... The number one way to reduce CO2 emissions in the globe that, that makes the biggest impact is switching from generating electricity from coal to natural gas. That is the best way to lower CO2 emissions. It makes the biggest impact. It's the cheapest. That means you have to buy the natural gas from somebody. Right. That's why Exxon's supporting this. They're doing it for marketing reasons, but not what you think. They're doing it because they want to sell their natural gas all over the world. You know, The U.S. is becoming more and more of a natural gas exporter. And yes, I know LNG is dirt cheap right now, but it will come. It will, prices will creep back up, and so that's the world we live in. You know, when Shell bought BG, Shell effectively turned itself into a natural gas company, which was smart. Exxon's doing the same thing. So of course, big oil and gas companies support this because that means that the world needs to buy what they produce, which is natural gas. Right, and I, I've heard you say before uh, multiple times that that Exxon is. How do you say that they're the best in the business or the smartest in the business? Uh, yeah, so um, I have a lot of friends there. I don't like doing business with Exxon because they're a pain in the butt, but they are the best oil and gas engineering and project management company on the planet, bar none. Uh, they're just the best at it. They don't make bad decisions, and they do things at a lower, I um, mean, at a higher margin and more environmentally responsible than, than anybody I know. Okay, so let's transition to oil and gas now. Let's talk about OPEC. They've announced that they're going to continue the freeze. What do you think about that? Did, is it kind? Of, I know there was kind of a mixed reaction. The market really wasn't excited about that. What were your thoughts on it? So, so OPEC's in a unique position. OPEC has basically, and I've said this before, and I think you and I have talked about this off the mic, um, OPEC is power, is this ability to control supply and demand. And OPEC is basically a cartel with a bunch of member nations, Saudi Arabia being the largest one. And if they are able to control supply, then they're able to keep prices where they want, sort of like De Beers does with diamonds, same, same exact type of thing. But I am firmly convinced that we're seeing the beginning of the destabilization of OPEC, and, and, and OPEC knows it, specifically Saudi Arabia. So you're seeing things happen that, that normally what you wouldn't think would happen. So you're seeing Saudi Arabia invest in downstream, right? What do you, what they do in building refineries and petrochemical plants? It's because they want more of the value change, because they know that just selling raw crude on the market is not going to keep them going like it has all this time. So uh, the freeze was the right thing for them to do. The other piece of information that a lot of people – don't get right is, you know, there's a lot of people out there saying that Saudi Arabia is trying to put the frackers out of business and the frackers are competing with Saudi Arabia. And in a lot of ways, it's not true. The crude that we produce here in the U.S. is light and sweet. It's actually ridiculously easy to refine. So the refineries in Central and South America love our crude, right? Now, 
We, however, like the heavy complex crudes. In fact, we're one of the few countries in the world that can refine that stuff because it's such a technological challenge. So we like that heavy complex crude, which comes from the Middle East. So even though they're both oil, it's really two different types of oil with two different markets and two different appetites. Now, from a gas point of view, yeah, we compete with the world in that, and we'll continue to do that. And between us and Russia, as, as long as we don't ruin our relationship with Russia anymore, it has. Between us and Russia, we can outproduce um, the OPEC in natural gas anytime we feel like. We just have to turn the taps on. So the freeze is expected. Um, OPEC will continue tr to try to maintain that cartel, to try to keep prices in a, a place where they can make money. Uh, the enemies of, of OPEC can't reap in tons of money. Um, and, but I think it's slowly but surely just going to fall apart. And I think as soon as you have one of the big countries pull out of OPEC, um, you, you're going to see the rest of them follow suit. Because what happens is as soon as one of the big countries pulls out, pulls out and they start producing what they want instead of listening to OPEC, the other countries will have to as well just, just to be able to keep up. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned there, I talked about on a lot of the podcasts before, is you'll, you'll see a lot of titles that kind of the Permian versus OPEC, and it kind of pits these two things together that I don't really think are similar. The Permian and OPEC, they're not similar. I mean, OPEC is a group of nations, and the Permian is just an, an area. And so I, why do you think it is, and maybe I'm wrong here, but why do you think it is that we see that the media kind of pits these two things that aren't really in competition, in competition, because for me, it doesn't seem to be a one-to-one -one there. Yeah. It's a couple of things. One of it, quite honestly, is ignorance. Um, I, I have seen some stuff in the last five years in mainstream media that I'm just like a gasp at. I, uh, two years ago, there was an article on CNN. Now, CNN's a respected organ, news organization talking about how the low crude prices were hurting the frackers in oil sands. And I read it three times. It's like, that's a different geology. They don't frack in the oil sands. Right. They either heat it in the ground or they strip mine it. How did CNN make that type of elementary mistake? But they did. So part of it's just ignorance. Another part of it is it makes good news. You know, anytime there's somebody pitched against somebody else, think about sports. Think about how much people love sports here and in Europe. It's because what you're really liking is one team against the other. So by pitching the Permian against OPEC, you get that same type of buy-in by the audience. And then quite frankly, it just makes it makes good news story. Um, it's it's you know it shows that you know the, the small Permian is battling the giant OPEC. Right. And it's not it's not really true. Right. Yeah. Another article I saw. <laughs> It said that uh, the, the land prices in the Permian were 10 times higher than they were in the Balkan, and therefore the Permian may be on the ropes. And I was like, well, well, well there's a lot of other factors besides land prices. You know, I mean, it's oh, I there's mean, a ton. Of, yeah, <laughs> that could be that. Uh, I, granted, that's that's important. But, you know, compared to the Balkan to the Permian on land prices alone, is not probably the best way to do it? No, no. And it's things like infrastructure. I mean, that's a huge part of the cost. You know, do you have infrastructure to move that oil and gas around and move that water around? Um, yeah, there's so many moving parts in there. So, I mean, you know this. You know, we, every year uh, we do our predictions for the next year. So, November of this year, we'll do our predictions for 2018. And one of the hardest things to do is predict what the price of crude and gas is going to be because there's so many variables. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's, it's, it's hard, to, even for the experts, it's hard for the experts to even get it close, much less right. And, but one of the things that is to our benefit in our shale basins is the workability and the smarts of the companies that are out there operate. I mean, during this low crude price, look at how much money, how much efficiencies have been have ringed out of the system. Now, some of that, quite honestly, is, is the service companies just taking it on the nose, right? Oh, yeah. Just trying to keep their people working. And, and I think that's going to change the end of this year. I think by the end of 2017, the service companies are going to have the upper hand again, and the operators are going to have to compete to get service company time. Um, but still, there's been a bunch of efficiencies. Some very smart people looked at what we're doing and go, you know what? We can do better, and let's, let's figure out how. Yeah, and one of the things I'm curious about is you talk about you know kind of try to game the system and, and figure out how to work in the market. I've got a prediction here, and, and love to hear your thoughts on it. I, I'm I'm thinking that what we'll see here, uh, maybe next five years or so, is that the the Eagleford, because land prices are really cheap there, and there is infrastructure in place, will become more of an asset to Mexico because it's right there. You can sell your gas to Mexico. Permian, which has gas in it as well, will be more for what we're seeing traditionally, and so you might see a shift where the Eagleford shell. It has people down there, people are working, and it can just sell naturally to Mexico, who still is a long way away before they can drill at any real pace to kind of meet their demand. What do you think about that? You're spot on. I mean, you're spot on. So what's happening in Central and South America is they're pulling their people out of poverty. And the first thing they need is cheap, abundant energy. And when I say energy, I mean electricity. So they're building electrical generating plants all over the place, and they need to fuel it with natural gas because it makes the most sense from a cost point of view and from an environmental point of view. And unfortunately, they have tons and tons and tons of natural gas, but they can't get it out the ground. So it's actually cheaper. You know, everybody talks about, um, God, what's the pipeline that's in the news all the time? 
Oh, Keystone. Keystone. Everybody's Everybody talked about Keystone. Like, yeah, okay. What nobody talks about is the hundreds of pipelines Texas is building across the border right. of Mexico right. so that we can sell our natural gas to Mexico so they can produce cheap, abundant energy for its people and pull our population. So that's a, that's a huge story. You hit the nail on the head. There's a lot of opportunity there, a lot of money to be made there. In Central and South America, there's going to be a lot of money to be made in oil and gas for the next decade or so. That's, good. that's a real high growth spot. Well, I'll stay out of the prediction business now that I've gotten one right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so final thing. We wanted to have you on the Trump 100-Day Roundtable, and obviously you know, you were busy that week, and we almost, I almost wanted to move it uh, just to get you on because you are so knowledgeable. Uh, give me your thoughts on Trump. What, you know, I know you were really excited. We talked before he came into the office. What do you think so far? Yeah, so and, – and I, I wish somebody would take his Twitter. I wish somebody would take his cell phone away, <laughs> right? I wish he'd just shut up on Twitter. I mean – one of the things, and so I'm a big fan of what Trump has accomplished, and especially c- considering the environment he's trying to accomplish, then where there's enemies everywhere, people that hate his guts. Right. You know, you saw like Kathy Gifford did. I oh, mean, yeah, that was yeah, that's yeah. De- deplorable, deplorable. You know, um, but he does need to just shut up sometimes. He um he doesn't necessarily put himself in the in what I would consider the traditional American leader role. He he gets into like pissing matches on Twitter, mm-hmm. and I just mm-hmm. wish he would stop doing it. But I think he's doing a really good job. I think he's doing a good job trying to restore prosperity in the U.S. I think he's doing a good job trying to keep Americans safe, both in our country and outside our country. I think he's doing a damn good job holding the government accountable for stuff, which is something that nobody's ever done. Nobody. And, you know, he's looking to uh, beef up the military, which, you know, I'm a big believer in that. Right. He's uh, trying to end illegal immigration. And people understand he's not trying to get rid of n- uh, legal immigrants. He loves legal immigrants. He's trying to get the ones that are here illegally. And so I think he's just going to be a boom for our economy. I, I, I think he's doing the right things. Uh, if you look at his cabinet, I mean, this is like the A-list in the world. These aren't politicians. These are people that can run a business. And if they need to have political acrimony, he makes sure they have that. So I think he's doing a really good job. The analogy I give is if you look in corporate America, a lot of times a big company will get in trouble, right? They kind of lost their way. Mm-hmm. And I mean big old companies. And so what they'll do is the board will bring in a fix-it CEO. And that guy's job is nothing but put the company back where it needs to be. And when he's finished doing that, and he, that CEO rubs a lot of people the wrong way, a right, lot of people don't that. like him. But he, once he gets that company back where it should be, then they bring in a, a different type of CEO to run that company moving forward. And I sort of think that's what Trump is. I think he's the fix-it CEO or the fix-it president. And I think if we can get our country back on track, we can bring somebody in that has more of a leadership style to keep it staying on track. <laughs> well, Mark, you have been gracious as always. And I, I just want to get it out there. I'm going to put you on the spot. Episode one. Episode 50, can we put you down tentatively, because I know you're busy, for episode 100. Just about it, that this show is, you know, <laughs> it is halfway worth listening to from time to time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I will absolutely love to come on as many times as you want me on, as much as your listeners can stand listening to me talk. Oh. I'll be happy to come on anytime, Ryan. Well, you are the godfather of oil and gas podcast. A um, couple things here. I want to let you promote your shows, because you have a lot going on for your company. Obviously, you're big in the APIYP. We've talked about that on here before. That's an important group. Go ahead and plug everything that you need to plug, and, and just... Hey, your newsletter, I was talking to someone the other day about it. You know, it's got all this great stuff in there. So you've got, you could probably plug and promote what you've got going on for an hour, but give people the core stuff where they can get the maximum value from what Mark LaCour is offering. Yeah. So, so we're hip deep in this new media. Uh, we have three shows on the books right now. So we have um, Oil and Gas Industry Leaders. We have Oil and Gas hs e We have Oil and Gas This Week. Um, each one has their own website. They're really easy to find. You can Google it. So go check out those shows. If you like it, uh, give us a listen. Go ahead and subscribe. The uh, API Young Professionals, if you're a young professional this, in this industry, uh, it's $25 a year to join. You're crazy not to join. You right. so Google them. You can find them as well. I mean, Ryan, we took them on an offshore rig tour. They've toured Baker Hughes and Halliburton and National Oil Well. I mean, just doing some really great stuff. Um, my business, I really don't want to promote my business. I mean, I run modalpoint.com. We're a market research company. Um, but everything else, the, the new media stuff, the young professionals, that's the stuff I want people to be aware of because that's that's where, where we're all going. And it's it's just a great journey. And it's nice to have people like you out there uh, to take this journey along with us. I got to go to the Honeywell event. Uh, was that in April? And I really enjoyed that. It was really neat to kind of get in there behind the scenes and just kind of hear what all they got going on. Really big company, really a lot of stuff. But hey, you may not want to promote your company, but I want to promote your newsletter. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Just events. And, and I say a lot of good stuff. It's just a lot of good events. Yeah, the story's funny. So when I started my own company um, about seven years ago, I could not find one place online where I could find all the oil and gas events in one place. And it's like, this is aggravating. So I built that newsletter for myself. So my <laughs> interns actually do that. They, they scour the internet, find all the good stuff, put it in one place, and we email it out once a month for free. So um, you can find that if you, if you want to go sign up, go to modalpoint.com, click on like any of the pages, and on the right, you'll see you can sign up for the newsletter. We don't spam you. 
You can yeah, unsubscribe yeah. at any time, but it's actually really useful. And then the funny thing about it is the oil and gas companies now know that I have this audience of people that are interested in events. So they give me stuff. So like OTC, everybody wants me to give away free OTC passes because they know that if they my audience gets a free OTC pass, the odds are they work for an oil and gas company because they're interested in oil and gas events. So it's, you know, it's uh, we give away a lot of free stuff there, a lot of insider only stuff, stuff the public isn't aware of. And it's it's I've had a lot of people tell me it's a useful tool, which which makes me happy. I'm glad people find value in it. No, it is valuable. I was looking at it uh, just last week when you I think you sent out last uh, Thursday or so. And I was looking at it and, you know, chock full of events. There was a webinar that We'll probably be, be gone by the time this podcast airs, but I was looking, I think it was with BP. I was looking, I was like, ooh, that, that's something that I want to I want to make sure I attend. So, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for all you do for the young professionals and for the industry in general. Uh, you are a, a thought leader, and we really appreciate you coming on. That was great, Ryan. Looking forward to joining you again. If I said it once, I've said it a hundred times, Mark Rahor is the man when it comes to oil and gas knowledge. He just knows so much and really appreciate him taking his time out today. Be sure to sign up for his newsletter. I find all kinds of value in that thing on a monthly basis. It's not spam. He doesn't send you promotionals. He, he, he sends what he says, which is a once-a-month newsletter that gets you information about what's going on. And uh, the June one was spectacular, as always. So hope you enjoyed the episode. And just a quick fact. I didn't tell Mark this, and I probably should have. He is still one of the top 10 all-time download podcasts for the Global Energy Leaders. So he is a, you know, a, a heavyweight in the industry. If you don't listen to his shows, I can't recommend them enough. So thank you so much, and I really hope you enjoyed it, and thanks again, Mark. The Global Energy Leaders Podcast is produced by Michael Sims and Chris Prine. Chris Prine also serves as editor for the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. Until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R-Squared Global.